Uh, it's one of those songs that I truly I'm stirred by. Thank you. Everything, everything we sing stirs me today. I seem to be more stirred than perhaps other days. That's not a bad thing, uh, I suppose. But, um, you know, that last song, it fits so well to what I'm going to share with you this morning in the Word of God. And I invite you to turn to Luke chapter 5. And we'll be in Luke 5 and we'll begin reading uh, there towards the end at verse 33. Luke 5 beginning in verse 33. And we're going to read through the end of the chapter, verse 39 in Luke chapter 5. And you're welcome as you find that to honor God's Word. Um, those especially who were present with me. Excuse me, this morning, um, I want you to do that. This is what the Word of God says to us in Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 33. Then they said to him, Why do the disciples of John fast and often make prayers, and likewise those of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink? And he said to them, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and they will fast in those days. Then he spoke a parable to them. No one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one, otherwise the new makes a tear. And also the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled. And the wineskins will be ruined. But the new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. And no one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires new, for he says, the old is better. Father, do bless us and Teach us this morning from the Word of God and help us, Father, to learn this Word and share this Word with others to your name's sake. Apply it to his Father. Teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, I want to speak to you today about the new work of Christ. And let me begin like this. I want to tell you, in 1971, there's a movie came out that still one of my favorites. Many of you will know it. Most of you will know it. If you've not seen it, you absolutely must go see this movie. You can rent it. You can watch it online. You can stream it. Um, it's called Fiddler on the Roof. And love that movie. And the opening scene and the opening song sets the tradition, sets the stage for the entire movie. The song is called Tradition. And Tevye speaks about how they dress and how they work and how they sleep. And then he points to a prayer shawl he's wearing around his waist. And he says this about that prayer shawl showing devotion to God. He said, how did this tradition get started? I will tell you. I don't know. But it's a tradition. And because of our tradition, everyone knows who he is and what God expects of him. Why he could have been taught by the scribes and the Pharisees in the days of Jesus. And our picture in the text cannot be clearer. Jesus is trampling the traditions of the theological experts in the entire country. He hangs out with tax collectors and morally objectionable people. He goes to their parties. He doesn't fast according to the religious prescription he doesn't write a law and tell his followers to fast either. What Jesus does confounds and irritates the religious crowd. And that's when Jesus shares this two-part parable about something old and something new about his new work. And I want to show you 
what it means this morning. Here's the bottom line. I'm just going to give it to you up front. Please don't click out of this now, <laughs> you know, as you're watching this. But here's the bottom line. The old covenant is replaced with the new covenant. The old nature is replaced by the new nature. And we need to look at the manner, the method, and the message that's wrapped around these truths that are set before us. And I'm, I'm just going to begin with the manner of replacement. Look what replaces the old it is replaced, you need to see this, it's in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20. It's replaced by a new and a living way. Just listen to the Word of God. You might want to turn because we'll look at multiple passages to get the full context. But this is what the Bible says. I'm going to begin reading in verse 19 of this. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Look at this. Hebrews 10, 20, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. That's what he says to us. Now, I'm going to repeat myself here, and I'll probably do it too many times this morning, but we need to understand all of Hebrews chapter 10 to grasp the significance of that verse of Scripture, verse 20. The old sacrifices have been replaced by the new sacrifice of the body of Jesus. That's verses 1 through 10. The law can never purify from sin. The law can never purify from sin. It cannot do it. The old demand of the law for continual daily monthly and annual sacrifices on specified hours and specified days was replaced by the new deliverance and liberty in Christ Jesus. That's verses 11 through 18. The old veil of the temple is replaced by the new veil of the flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's verses 19 and following. The old life, ladies and gentlemen, is replaced by the new birth. Here comes Nicodemus, John chapter 3, and he's come at nighttime, and he sits down with Jesus, and he says, you got to be from God because no one can do what you're doing unless he comes from God. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, I want to tell you something, friend. Unless someone's born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was absolutely flabbergasted. How can a man possibly be old, born again when he's old? How can he go back into his mother's womb and this happen all over again? And you see, Jesus spoke to him about the old life and how the old life must be replaced with a new life with a new birth, and that very issue stands before us. The old is replaced with the new, but I got to tell you something, it's deeper than this, ladies and gentlemen. I want to show you the method by which God accomplishes this, because this is where we get, this is where the water hits the wheel, this is where we get real serious with what I'm saying to you. This is what he does, he replaces the old nature with the new nature. He does this. He replaces the old nature with the new nature. You see, God makes us awake as a new creation. I want to show you something. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in this passage of Scripture, in verses 16 and 17 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we have these words. And it's speaking about what Jesus has done. You can go back. You can just keep going back in 2 Corinthians 5. And you'll find more and more context for this. But, but um, we're talking about people who have been raised from the dead, uh, spiritually speaking. We're talking about people who have been born again. This is what the Bible says. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Uh, Bo, that's your sin nature we're talking about there. We regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. 
old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And that's what he tells us in this, in this particular passage of Scripture. But wait a minute. There's even more than that. In Ephesians chapter 2, we have this wonderful passage of Scripture which begins by describing us as being dead in our trespasses and sins and walking according to the course of this world. We did not seek God. There's none who seeks God. No, not one. Not a single one of us. But yet, the Bible says this, but God, but God, who's rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace have you been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Does that not crank your motor, y'all? This is what he has done. God has given to us a new heart. Why, how marvelous this is. God has given to us a new spirit. Listen to Ezekiel, if you would please, in the Old Testament and verse 19, and what the Word of God says there. Then will I give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within them, and take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a new heart of flesh. You see, before you know Christ, you got a hard heart. You have a heart that's hardened to the things of God. You don't want to go the way that God goes. You don't want to follow what the Lord teaches in His Word. You want to follow self. You want to follow your own way. But then when you come to Christ, when the Spirit of God awakens you, illuminates you, if you will, to understand that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, in that moment, God gives you a new heart, and he gives you a new spirit. What does that mean? It means he places his Holy Spirit within you. He does that. He wakes us up. He makes us as a new creation. But he does more than that. God raises us up to walk in the newness of life. Y'all know that passage of scripture in Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. And, and it speaks of being baptized. It's not water baptism there. The baptism that he's speaking of there is being baptized into Christ. And it's a picture. It shows us the death and the burial and the resurrection of, of Christ Jesus, but also of our old self. And we're raised up to walk in the newness of life. Love that passage of Scripture. Love watching my grandson. I love watching him discover things and discover how to speak and become more and more aware of the life that is around him. That is absolutely one of the precious things. Wouldn't y'all agree? Y'all have seen that. But now about you and about me, this is what I want you to understand. We're talking about what God is doing within our hearts in the old nature. When he raises us up to walk in the newness of life, hear me, listen. The old nature is now powerless to control us. You know that old sin nature we have? You'll find out about it again in Romans chapter 7 when you get there in your studies in the, in the Bible study lessons, Sunday school uh, lessons that we'll have chapter 5 tonight in, in, uh, at 5 o'clock. Uh, that old nature, man, I'm telling you, it just calls out, it pulls, it, it's there all the way, all the time calling out. But you know what? When you are raised to walk in newness of life, it's powerless to control you. The new nature for those who walk in newness of life claims control. You can give permission to the old nature to control you. You can do that. You can, you can yield to the demands of the old nature, but it's powerless to control you. You can also tell the old nature no, and it's powerless. 
But God purposes not only that we walk in newness of life, not only are we a new creation, God purposes that we walk in newness of the Spirit. I want you to look over at Romans chapter uh, 7 for a moment. I told you we were getting in there, but Romans chapter 7. I want you to see what the Bible says here in Romans chapter 7. And we're going to read one verse of Scripture, Romans chapter 7 and verse 6. The Bible says this, but now, y'all, when is now? When is now? When is now? Right now. Ahora. Now, we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of of the spirit, you see that? And not the oldness of the letter. So God awakes us as a new creation. God raises us up to walk in the newness of life. And God purposes that we work in the spirit, in the newness of the spirit. You see, this is something I come back to over and over and some of y'all sigh and honestly sometimes we roll our eyes when we say not again, not again. But it's got to be said, ladies and gentlemen, a holy God does holy work. And God put his Holy Spirit within us so that we may have the strength and the desire and the power to live in his will for us. So what does God do? How does he accomplish replacing the old nature with the new nature beyond that? On a practical level, God calls us to work on renewing our minds. You know Romans 12 very well. In verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, just because we're called to a new walk does not mean we will always think with a new mind. We must renew our minds each opportunity that's ours. We must renew our minds or this new walk and the new work, the new service, the new life in the Spirit will become stale and just grows cold. And one day you wake up and you say, why? Why do I keep doing this? Why do I do this? It gets stale without renewing the mind. So somebody might say, big deal. What's the message of all of this? Here are you talking about the old nature and the new nature, and, and oh, there's so much we could talk about the old covenant, new covenant, isn't there? <laughs> I mean, there's so much. What's Jesus saying to the scribes and the Pharisees that question him about the disciples' practices it boils down to this, the old nature must, must, must be replaced with the new nature. It must. The old nature, just like the old covenant, is incompatible with the new nature, just as the old covenant is incompatible with the new covenant. Look back at our text in Luke chapter 5. Let me show you as we look at this in verses 36 and 37. What it says to us there, he spoke a parable. No one puts a piece of, uh, from a new garment on an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear, and the old, also the piece that was taken out of the new, does not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. That's what he teaches us in this passage of Scripture. First, he points out, obviously, as we've seen, to the weaver's work. And, and here's the thing that you need to remember. A new patch can mar the old pants. It can do it. Um, we had something that tore, Pam and I, uh, recently. 
We had something that tore, and I said, well, look, we can just, you know, throw it up. No, we can't do that. <laughs> because uh, that new patch tears up the old one. It mars it even worse. And it doesn't match. The new patch doesn't match the old pants. That's one thing I learned. Some of y'all did too when you were coming up in school. And I don't know about y'all, but we played rough. I mean, we were outside. We weren't sitting behind a computer or a smartphone. We were outside playing. And we'd play every kind of imaginable game there was. And we boys would get together and we'd have dirt clod wars. And we would have all kinds of fun like that. We would run, we played baseball, and we'd slide into base, and our pants, our knees would rip. And here comes Mama. Here comes Mama. And she's got a patch, and she patches that up. I know she's watching this. <laughs> hey, Ma. And she patches it up, and it always looked different. The, you know, I didn't care. I didn't care, but it didn't match. And if you were worried about it matching, you in a whole lot of trouble because it's not going to match. It isn't going to happen. But then Jesus points to the winemaker's work and what he does when he talks about the, the, the bottles there, the, the wineskins or the bottles. Listen, the old bottle is brittle, but the new wine is burgeoning and it's going to come out. And when it does, it's going to break that old bottle because that old bottle that has been conditioned to what was in it before. And so you can't put anything else in it. This is what I want you to understand. The new nature is incompatible with the old nature. The new covenant is incompatible with the new covenant. The, the uh, Judaizers we came from Jerusalem and they, they went to the, the region of Galatia and, and beyond in Asia and they were telling people you need to follow principles of the old covenant in order for you to be right with God. Ladies and gentlemen, you cannot do it. The new covenant and the old covenant are incompatible in that sense. We are saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Incompatibility. But let me talk to you because there's also a level of a measure of incorruptibility in this as well. The new nature, the new nature is incorruptible. The old nature, Colossians teaches this, grows corrupt. And the word for grows, the, the, the verb tense means it just keeps on growing more and more corrupt. As time goes on. Y'all have seen, you've seen people who were nice when they're young, but when they hit a certain age, they become crotchety. You know what I'm talking about? Why is that? Because the old nature grows corrupt. It really does. And if you let the old nature reign, then what people are going to see is that crotchety nature. That mean nature. Got to be careful with that. It, it's, it's incorruptible though. Now it's time for the Greek word of the month. <laughs> Maybe the week. I don't know. I don't know if I'll share. Well, next month is April. I mean, next week is April, so we're good there. It's time for the Greek word. The word translated uh, as a phrase here, both are preserved. Verse 38, let me read that verse to you. But the new wine must be put into new wineskins and both are preserved. That phrase, both are preserved, the, the word is sunte, suntereo, suntereo. Now you can pronounce that, suntereo. Now here's your nice word. It's made up of two words though. And, and uh, one is the root word and the other is a prefix to it there. And those two words come out to mean preserved together. That's what it means. So when you put the new wine into new wine skins, both are preserved together. That's what it's saying to us. They are preserved together. Now what, listen, this is why it's important. What God did in you 
when he saved you and made you into new wineskin is not something to be repeated over and over again. There's the tense of the verb that you need to follow there. This is what it's speaking to us about. It doesn't happen over and over and over and over and over again. When Jesus saved you and Jesus redeemed you and Jesus raised you to walk in newness of life, when he did that, ladies and gentlemen, it was forever. Isn't that great? Isn't that just splendid? What he did? What God did in establishing the new covenant through Jesus does not need to be redone at a later date. Let me remind you of the old covenant. The sacrifices had to be repeated over and over. They had to go in every day. They had to go in in the morning and offer a sacrifice. They had to go in in the evening and offer a sacrifice. They had daily sacrifices, weekly sacrifices, monthly sacrifices, annual sacrifices. They had to offer sacrifices. The high priest had to go in and offer a sacrifice for himself before he could offer sacrifices for others. All of this went on and on and on. But once Jesus, once Jesus paid the price on the cross, when he did that, it was once for all time. Wow. There's a verb here. I just want to get to it. Not a verb. Well, it, it's part of a verb at the beginning of the sentence. The new wine must be put. It can't happen any other way. It must be put there. But here you go. Let me get towards the end on this. Those who live according to the old nature will find the new nature undesirable. Those who live according to the old covenant find the new covenant undesirable. You say, where is that? Look at verse 39. I'm glad you asked that question. And no one having drunk old wine immediately desires new, for he says, the old is better. The mixed multitude. You remember them? They came out with Israel and and when, when, when Moses led them out of Egypt and they saw everything God did, the mixed multitude was right there. There's Moses, there, there is Israel, but there is also that mixed multitude all coming out together. All who said, I kind of like what I'm seeing God do here. And they saw the Red Sea part. They had seen all of the plagues. And now they see the Red Sea part. And they come to the other side. And then they see Moses throw a, a branch into a, 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 a stagnant uh, pond and, and all of them are able to drink from that because the water is made sweet in that moment and fresh. And then they see God provide water out of rock. And then they see the manna on a regular basis. And this mixed multitude said, Oh, Man, I miss Egypt. Golly, I miss Egypt so bad. Why is that? They may have gotten them out of Egypt, but Egypt was still in their hearts. And people with Egypt still in their heart. People with that old sin nature still on the throne, find the new things of God to be undesirable. The man or the woman who has come to the light of the gospel, but has never been transformed by the life of the gospel, will find the ways of this world more desirable 
than the ways of Christ Jesus. I've seen it so many times. But let me tell you a story. Pam and I watched a show recently. We've been watching it, you know, on, on Amazon Prime. It's called Jamestown. About Jamestown, Virginia in the early 1600s. And among the characters, there's this character uh, who's a tavern owner. He's drunk. And his fiance wants him to quit drinking. Because he's just, you know, he just, you, it's all he does is get drunk. And she dares him and says, I dare you go a full month, a full month, one month, without anything to drink. He said, I couldn't do it. And the next scene that you see them together, he's outside and he's fussing. And I mean, he's complaining. He said, how long has it been? She said, two days. <laughs> and that night comes around and he said, I am not staying in this place. I'm not staying anywhere close to where you are. I'm going to walk all night long. And so he gets out and he walks. She follows him. And he goes down and he sits down by the river. And he's down there by the river and he's seated on, on the, right there by the river and hanging his feet over the, the, the little pier there. And he's talking and he tells something about his life. But then he turns around and there's a sunset. Oh, so, I mean, they timed it just right. And it was so beautiful setting over the tops of the trees. And he said, my, look at the sunset. Look how beautiful. He turns to her and he says, is it always like this? And she said, yes, it is. Oh. The next scene, he's back in his tavern and he tells his friends. Nobody said, I can't have but one. And he pours himself a stein of ale. And you know what happens. Then another and another. And he comes staggering in. As they used to say, drunk as Cooter Brown. A person whose heart is filled with Egypt will follow the ways of Egypt. A person who lives in bondage to sin will follow the ways of sin. But I came to tell you something today. Jesus came to do a new work. And he came to make you into a new creation. And he came to give you a new will to follow new ways and to have a new outlook and a new spirit and a new mind. He came to give all that to you. It's yours. It's there. It's for you. And the Lord Jesus offers it right now. To someone who's watching this, he offers it right now. Jesus Christ did all the work on the cross. He did it all. What we must do is receive the work that Jesus did. The new covenant is established and based on the finished, completed work of Jesus Christ done once and forever. We must turn from sin and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. You must receive Jesus in your life. You must call on him and let him enter into your heart and to your life. And I want to invite you to do that right now. I want to invite you right now to turn away from sin and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who died for you. He established this new agreement with God, this new covenant. He did it. And when you trust Jesus and receive Jesus, 
and you, I mean, with all your heart, you give him your life and invite him into your life, what a change he makes in your heart. What a change. And you can do this now. You can tell him, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. And I've been following my old ways, ways of this world. But Lord, I want to turn from sin. And Lord, I want to ask you now to forgive me because I believe you died on the cross for me. So forgive me and come into my life and change me. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Thank you. And you know if you prayed that, you can write us at info at 38th Avenue Baptist .org and we'll talk with you. We'll do that. And Christ followers, brothers and sisters, let me encourage you. Let me encourage you. Make sure you're not following the ways of Egypt. Make sure Egypt stays far, far away from control of your heart. Make sure your old nature doesn't do it.